Good evening, and welcome to Journeys, the 25th anniversary of the Chicago's Humanities Festival. The Chicago Humanities Festival, sorry about that. Uh, please quiet your cell phones. This evening, we welcome Gary Steinhardt back to the Chicago Humanities Festival. He was here earlier this year. Before I say a few words about the Crown Family Center for Jewish and Israel Studies, please allow me, on behalf of the Chicago Humanities Festival, to acknowledge a few significant partners in tonight's event. We are grateful for the support of Dolores Cole Kaplan and the Morris and Dolores Cole Kaplan Fund at the Dolores Cole Education Foundation for underwriting Northwestern Day at the Chicago Humanities Festival. Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities and the offices of Northwestern's president and provost are also appreciated Northwestern Day partners. Special thanks is necessary for all Chicago Humanities Festival members and specifically for the Charter Humanists, our generous donors, who wear red badges and sit in a reserve section. CHF's donors fund over 80% of the festival and their philanthropy enables Chicago Humanities Festival's low ticket prices. Thanks also to Unabridged Bookstore for being our partner bookseller and providing a 10% discount on sales of Gary Steingart's book. This evening's lecture by Gary Steingart, actually more of a reading followed by a conversation, but more on that later, is the 2014 Renee and Lester Crown Lecture for the Crown Family Center for Jewish and Israel Studies. The Crown Center, which I direct, manages, by the way, I'm Gary the Crown, the Crown Center manages Jewish studies as an academic discipline at Northwestern and creates opportunities for our non-campus public to engage Jewish high culture and scholarship. Tonight's talk is one of four annual endowed public lectures. The gift that established this lecture was given by friends of Renee and Lester Crown in their honor. For those in that group who are present tonight, uh, thank you very much. If you would like to learn about future events and other learning opportunities that we provide, please provide us with your email address on your way out. There's a table on the outside where you can give us your name, or contact us through our website. But now to our main event. In 2010, Gal Beckerman, an editor of the Jewish Forward, published when they come for us, we'll be gone. A history of the American struggle to rescue Soviet Jews. The book's title, When They Come For Us, We'll Be Gone, is the lyric to a song entitled Mother Russia by Safam, an American Jewish pop band from the late 70s. As an American Jew, born in the 70s, I put this song in the rare category of songs like Papa Nagila and Am Yisrael Chai, for those of you who know, that transcended the denominational politics of the Jewish community and became unifying anthems. In the aftermath of the 60s and its legacy of political songs, there were other songs written about the plight of Soviet Jews. What distinguished Safam's mother Russia were its simplicity and its empathy. Here was a song that takes the perspective of a struggling Soviet Jew. We are leaving mother Russia. We have waited far too long. We, have leaving, we are leaving mother Russia. When they come for us, we'll be gone. The language of when they come for us connects the plight of Soviet Jews with the plight of Jews under the Nazis, many of whom waited incredulously until the Nazis came for them. For American Jews in the 70s, Jews in the Soviet Union represented an opportunity to assert themselves as Americans and assuage the still gnawing guilt regarding the timing of American intervention in the humanitarian crisis of World War II. Nothing galvanized and unified the American Jewish community of the 70s and early 80s more than the plight of Soviet Jews. And yet there was a serious disconnect between the idea of persecuted Soviet Jews and the Soviet Jews who began to materialize in my Jewish day school classes. <laughs> These students my own age were strange. Their clothes were different, their home lunches strange, and they struggled to speak English and shed their accents. And kids are kids. No ideological community unity is going to spare the strange immigrant child from isolation, exclusion, teasing, and occasionally violence. I believed in Soviet Jewry, but I had trouble embracing Soviet Jews. <laughs> Gary Steigart's memoir, Little Failure, is the story of one such boy transitioning from one side to the other at the height of the Cold War and experiencing that destabilizing transfer at an age in which it must have been impossible to process. The book transitions from early childhood memories to the fully realized psychoanalytic understandings of the gap that opens up between Gary, the increasingly Americanized son, and his parents, who Americanized materially but remain socioculturally within the liminal space of an American immigrant community. For fans of Steingart's highly decorated novels, 
There are points in the memoir where the author, both intentionally and unintentionally, flags the origins of characters, scenes, or plots from those prior books. And so it rewards people who've read his other literature. More significantly, I think the memoir provides an opportunity to understand the surprising and special voice that is unique to Gary Steigart's works. This voice that is knowing and satirical, earnest and antic, is a voice that always stands just a bit outside the culture in which it is embedded. It is a voice that communicates joy amid sorrow, that seems always willing to pull the reader on almost unplanned flights of fancy. These unplanned flights of fancy seem to me somehow connected to Steinhardt's flights from the Soviet Union to the United States, and to a pretend game involving a plane into which Steinhardt would regularly escape during this difficult transition period. Tonight, we get to hear the man behind this special voice, Gary Steinhardt. After Gary comes out and reads for a few minutes, Allison Cuddy, program director of the Chicago Humanities Festival, will join him on stage for a conversation. Then there will be an opportunity for audience questions. Please join me in welcoming Gary Schneider. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh my god, look at this crowd. Uh, it's so good to be back in Chicago. It's been eight months. You know. <laughs> I've been going crazy. Uh, my intake of beef has been just that is good. <laughs> um, and it's just great to be in with Evanston. Yes. Uh, yeah. Give it Evanston a hand. It's great. So uh, Bell used to walk around here. So Bell. Uh, well, you see too, but he went to school in Northwestern. Then. Uh, and I think the best. I mean, I've been touring for this book for God knows how long, but the best quote of the entire tour happened the last time I was here. Uh, I was signing books, and uh, um, a woman, I think of my generation, uh, with a slight Russian accent came up and said, You are the Russian Judy Blue. <laughs> I haven't cried since the 80s, but I, I cried. <laughs> I thought, Holy crap, Judy Blue, whom I just met last year. Uh, she was such a touchstone for me growing up for that book, Forever, that uh, incited sexuality in so many new people of my generation, uh, and other books too, Tales from a Fourth Grade, Nothing, and all that. But anyway, I'm proud to be compared to her. Um, so yeah, I'll read a little, and then I'll talk to Allison, and then uh, I'll entertain any questions or complaints that you may have. Uh, little failure, yeah. Uh, this is the hardcover, I think, uh, they now have the paperback and the giant teardrop to indicate <laughs> sadness. Um, but I, I, I like this cover because it features, uh, a, a, it has a nice picture of me um, in a car. Um, this is 1974. This is, uh, I was about a year and a half. And they had these photo studios in Russia, where they would, in the Soviet Union, where they would pose you with the latest in Soviet technology, so. <laughs> A fork. Yeah. <laughs> but I got a car, uh, which, you know, to most eyes looks like a 50 Studebaker, but was the latest in Muscovich technology. Uh, so, I'm very happy about this. Uh, I just learned how to drive last year at the age of 41 uh, because of this, because of the terrible damage that it inflicted. Um, the book is really about how I became a writer, and people often ask me, how do you become? Uh, a writer. Uh, there's two things. First, uh, you have to have asthma as a child. <laughs> it's useless without the asthma. Uh, on this tour, people have been coming up uh, and giving me their inhalers to sign. <laughs> so if anyone has inhalers, I will gladly, gladly sign them. Uh, especially Seattle, that seems to be the where asthma is more in America. Um, so growing up in Leningrad, which is built over a swamp, is the perfect place uh, for asthma and to become a writer. Uh, because in 74, they didn't have inhalers in the Soviet Union, the inhalers that we know and love. So each time I would have an asthma attack, uh, an ambulance would come and take me to the hospital. For a child to see mortality so up close is wonderful for becoming a writer. <laughs> so good. 
the second thing is you've got to have a grandmother who writes. Uh, and I had uh, my grandmother, Gaia, was a journalist for a paper called Evening Leningrad, which was far better than Morning Leningrad. <laughs> <laughs> trashy Soviet paper, the TMZ of Russian papers. <laughs> I said that in LA, and they're like, I write for TMZ. <laughs> They would have offices here. <laughs> so one day when I was about five years old, my grandmother said, Hey, asthma boy, uh, you want to become a novelist? You know? I said, Yeah, how much does it pay? Because I was already thinking like a writer, how much does it pay? Uh, and she said, I'll give you a piece of cheese for every page you write. Now, I used to love this uh, yellow orange sort of Soviet cheese that you could probably poke an eye out with. It's humongous thing. I, I, I just loved it. Uh, and right outside, so I was looking for a subject to write about. And right outside our window was the biggest statue of Lenin in all of Leningrad. And we called him the Latin Lenin. He looked like he was about to rumba. <laughs> Suave expression. Uh, and each morning I'd get up after my first asthma attack, I'd, I'd get up and just hug him around his pedestal. That's how I was hot. So the novel I wrote for Grandma was called Lenin and His Magical Goose. Uh, and in it, Lenin meets a talking goose. Uh, possibly from Armenia or Georgia or something like that. And together they invade Finland and try to create a socialist revolution. <laughs> now, I was obsessed with the whole Menshevik versus Bolshevik question, like any five year old boy. <laughs> obsessed. And in both the hardcover and the paperback, there's a picture on the inside cover of me wearing the typical outfit of the age for uh, the time for the, the five year old boy, which is a uh, Sailor suit with tights. <laughs> this is seven years of analysis, right here. <laughs> I don't know who to build this to. <laughs> and in, in this picture, I'm reading a gigantic Talmudic-sized book, and the book uh, was uh, was the, about the revolution of 1917. Uh, so you could tell that I was obsessed with this issue. So in my book, after Lenin and the Goose conquer Finland and make it safe for, for socialism, uh, they get into a huge political fight. Because it turns out that the goose is Menshevik. <laughs> Lenin, as we know, is Bolshevik. And in the end, Lenin eats the goose. <laughs> but not before we learn that he all, Lenin also suffers from asthma. <laughs> now, my grandmother loved it. She was a Bolshevik. She thought, great, eat the goose, fine. Uh, so she paid me 100 pieces of cheese for a 100 page novel. And a fun fact even today, Random House pays me in cheese. <laughs> which I then sell out of the back of a van at Canarsie. <laughs> so then we emigrated to America, and I had to leave Lenin behind, and I had to learn English and some Hebrew, because I was sentenced to eight years of Hebrew school. <laughs> Probably I didn't commit, but um, I this was in the introduction. Uh, and, and 1980 was a difficult time to be a Russian in America, as we just heard. Uh, the Ronald Reagan's Evil Empire speech, uh, all those movies, Red Dawn, Red Gerbil, Red Hamster, <laughs> Red, you know. Uh, so I pretended to the kids in Hebrew school that I was actually born in East Berlin, not in Leningrad. You know things are bad when you have to convince Jewish kids that you're actually a German. <laughs> shirt and one pair of pants and a bunch of t-shirts that the parents of the kids in Hebrew school were nice enough to donate. Uh, my toys were a pen and a Chewbacca action figure someone had given us that was missing half of its paw. And I had from Russia a fur coat and a fur hat made out of some fierce woodland animal. And the teachers would actually take me aside and say, you know, you really need to get rid of your fur. Uh, kids will play with you more if you're, if you're furless. <laughs> Actually, true in adulthood as well. Found out the hard way. Uh, <laughs> that one takes a while. Uh, and then, two years after we left Russia, something truly incredible happened that almost changed our lives forever, forever, forever. And I'll read you a section of that. In 1981, an official letter arrives in our mailbox Mr. S. Schuttgart. You have already won $10 million. <laughs> yeah, our last name is misspelled rather cruelly, but cardstock this thick does not lie, and the letter is from a major American publisher, the, the publisher's clearinghouse. 
I open the letter with shaking hands, and a check flutters out. Paid to the order of S. Shitgart. <laughs> Ten million and zero zero slash one hundred dollars. Our lives are about to change. I run down the stairs into the courtyard of our apartment complex. Mama, Papa, we won. We me down here. We are millionaires now. Calm down, my father says. You want another asthma attack? <laughs> but he's excited himself. Around the glowing surface of the orange dining table we've imported from Romania against all reason, we spread around the contents of this voluminous envelope. For two years, we have been good new citizens, accidentally watching X-rated movies on Main Street with titles like Emmanuel, The Joys of a Woman. <laughs> Getting jobs as junior engineers and clerk typists. My mother's pianist fingers will finally be put to meaningful use. Learning to pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and for the something for which that it stands, unavoidable with money for all. <laughs> Bojan Moy, my mother says, my God, as we look at the pictures on the envelope of a Mercedes flying off the deck of our yacht, toward our new mansion with its Olympic-sized swimming pool. Oi, she says, does it have to be Mercedes? Oh, Nazis. <laughs> Don't worry, we can trade for a Cadillac. Look, Mommy, the house on the envelope, there are palm trees. Maybe the house is in Florida. Ah, uh, Florida won't be good for your asthma with all that humidity. But I want to live in Miami. Maybe there aren't Hebrew schools in Miami. <laughs> Everywhere in America, there are Hebrew schools. <laughs> we sit down and using our collective 400 word English vocabulary, we begin to unravel, <laughs> begin to unravel the many documents before us. Wait, it says here that, yes, we have already won the $10 million, no so disputing that. But a panel of judges still has to award the money to us. So first we must fill out the winner's form and select five national magazines that will be sent to us free. <laughs> or at least the first issue of each will be free, and then the Americans will likely send us the rest of the $10 million. Fair enough. First we must acclimate to our new wealth, expand their literacy. I am proud of Papa's new car, a bulbous 1977 Chevrolet Malibu Classic with only seven million miles in the odometer, and it's time to get acquainted with the finer autos. So I order car and motor, motor and driver, carburetor and driver, muffler and odor. <laughs> and for the last selection, something that maybe has my Star Wars monkey Chewy Chewbacca in it, Isaac Asimov's Grr, science fiction magazine. We sign everywhere we need to, even places we probably don't need to. Sign the envelope. I walk solemnly to the mailbox and deposit our claim on the future. Adonai Eloheinu. I pray to our new God. Please help us get the ten million dollars so that mom and papa will not fight so much. And there will be no Razbot divorce between them. And let us live somewhere far away from papa's wolfish relatives who cause all the trouble. And let them not yell at mama when she sends the money. Papa says we don't have to her sisters and grandmother Gaia in Leningrad who has been dying for a very long time. <laughs> Amen. That night in my dreams, I walk into the Solomon Schefter School of Queens, a multi-millionaire, and the pretty girl with the big teeth, who's always tanned from Florida vacations, kisses me with those big teeth. I haven't gotten the mechanics of kissing them yet. The kids make fun of Jonah Himmelstein, the school's biggest loser, but I say, hey, he's my friend now. Here's two dollars. Buy us both the Carvel flying saucer cookie ice cream, and keep the change, you burnished, you nothing. <laughs> we find out the truth quickly and brutally. At their respective workplaces, my parents are told that the publisher's clearinghouse regularly sends out that you have already won $10 million, missive, and that these are routinely thrown into the trash by the savvy native born. The pressure settles over our non-millionaire shoulders. In Russia, the government was constantly telling us lies. Wheat harvest is up. Uzbek baby goats give milk at an all-time high. <laughs> Soviet crickets learn to sing the international on a record visit to the local hayfield. But we cannot imagine that they would lie to our faces like this here in America, the land of the this and the home of the that. And so we don't give up hope entirely. The judges are probably reading our application right now. Maybe I should write them a letter in my burgeoning English. Dear publisher, here in house. Spring is here, weather's warm, rainy, birds come from south to sing songs, 
My mother's pianist fingers hurt very much from her typing job. She has only one suit for work. Please send us 10 million right now. <laughs> we love you, and we find her. <laughs> Meanwhile, car and parking and the other publishers' clearinghouse magazines are starting to pile up, taunting us with the many hot, naked centerfolds of the new Porsche 911, the official sports group of Reagan era excess. We reluctantly begin to cancel our subscription to all of them, except for Asimov's science fiction magazine, a small, square little number with the drawing of an exciting, moving space creature on the cover, hugging a boy just like me in his claws. Our dreams of being instantly rich are finished, but we are moving up nonetheless. We are saving every kopeck that comes our way via my father's junior engineering job and my mother's typing. Here is our family inventory. I have my pen, my broken Chewbacca monkey, my recently circumcised penis, and a bunch of donated t-shirts. My mother has her size 2 hard Bernard business suit. My father has made a fishing rod out of a stick. Pounds of disgusting marked down farmer's cheese and kasha will feed us until we die of sadness. And if I don't clear my plate of that warm, soggy crap, the thunderclap of Papa's hand rings against my temple, my mommy yelling, don't hit his head! She's got to make money with his head. <laughs> Are we? Parents, me, give me, we are poor folks. Why can't I have the Chewbacca with both paws? <laughs> Parents, both paws, we are not Americans. <laughs> but you both have jobs. Parents, but we have to buy a house. A house, the first step to Americanism. Who needs the two-handed Chewbacca when we'll soon have our own quasi-suburban home? But at lunchtime, the Hebrew school boys do like to take out their loops and Obi-Wans and Yodas and set them on their desk to demonstrate just how much property falls within their purview. <laughs> they talk in their already raspy Jewish voices. I threw out my old Yoda because the paint on his ears was falling off, and then I got two new Yodas and a Princess Leia just so Ham Solo could do her. <laughs> because I wanted all that Soviet cheese, but I also wanted my grandmother to love me, and that was the easiest way to get her love. And so a terrible connection was forced in my mind that writing novels somehow equals love. What was I thinking? Most novels today are, are, are not love outside of Brooklyn. <laughs> I gave a reading at a university a few years ago. I'm not going to mention the University of Oklahoma by name, but... <laughs> Student there said, Excuse me, Mr. Shipgart, uh, <laughs> how do I know when a book's been fiction invaded? <laughs> I said, What? <laughs> she said, Yeah, yeah, how do I know when it's not true? I said, Well, it says novel on it, you know. <laughs> and she said, Well, thank you, I'm going to avoid those from now on because I want things to be true. <laughs> so I've been proud of my first non fiction invaded book. <laughs> Also, my, my first reading in L.A., somebody once said, uh, so who directed your book? <laughs> yeah. But back to life after not winning the publisher's clearing house in the Because I was the red journal, the second most hated boy at school, I thought, what if I wrote a science fiction novel and showed it to the kids in school? Maybe they'll learn to like it. Uh, some of these books, some of these novels I've written, still exist, thanks to my parents. They've saved them. So here's hundreds of pages of little boy scrawl. Uh, this one's called Invasion from Outer Space. Let's take a look inside. <laughs> Chapter one, something is wrong. <laughs> and it really was. <laughs> I didn't know the Russians were child services. <laughs> But then when I was about 11 years old, a momentous thing happened in the guise of a substitute teacher called Miss S. And I'll read you a section from that. On one of her first days in the job, Miss S asked us all to bring in our favorite items in the world and to explain why they make us who we are. I bring in my latest toy, a dysfunctional Apollo rocket whose capsule pops off with the press of a lever, but only under certain atmospheric conditions. Humidity must be below 54%. And explain that I have even written my own novel. This passes largely unremarked as the latest batch of Star Wars X-Wing fighters and My Little Ponies are paraded around. 
Finally, Miss S holds up a sneaker and explains that her favorite activity in the world is jogging. P.U., a boy cries out, pointing at the sneaker and holding his nose. And everyone except me laughs their wicked child laugh. I am shocked. Here is a young, kind, pretty teacher. And the children are intimating that her feet smell. Only me and my 200-pound Leningrad fur coat are allowed to smell around here. <laughs> I look to Miss S, so worried that she will cry. But instead she laughs and goes on about how running makes her feel good. After we have all finished explaining who we are, Miss S calls me over to her desk. You really wrote a novel, she asks? Yes, I say. <laughs> it is called The Challenge. May I read it? Hmm, yeah, you may read it. I will break it. <laughs> and break it, I do. <laughs> With the worried admonition, please don't lose Miss S, okay? And then it happens. At the end of the English period, when a book about a mouse who has learned how to fly in an airplane has been thoroughly dissected, Miss S announces, and now Gary will read from his novel. Says, what? Oh, but it doesn't matter, because I'm standing there holding my composition notebook straight from the Square Deal Notebook people of Dayton, Ohio, zip code 45463. <laughs> and looking at it, me are the boys beneath their little flying saucer yarmulkes, and the girls with their sweet aromatic bangs, their blouses studded with stars. And there's Miss S, who I'm already terribly in love with, but who I recently learned has a fiancé, not sure what that means, can't be good. <laughs> But whose bright American face is not just encouraging me, but priding me on. Am I scared? No, I am eager, eager to begin my new life. Introduction, I say. The mysterious race, before the age of dinosaurs, there was human life on Earth. They look just like men of today, but they're a lot more intelligent than men of today. Slowly, Miss S says. Read slowly, Gary. Let us enjoy the words. I bring that in. Miss S wants to enjoy my words. So I continue slower. They built all kinds of spaceships and other wonders, but at that time the Earth circled the moon because the moon was bigger than the Earth. One day, gigantic comet came and blew up moon to size it is today. As I'm reading it, despite the many errors, I'm hearing a different language come out of my mouth. I do full justice to the many misspellings the Earth circled the moon, and the Russian accent is still thick. But I am speaking in what is more or less comprehensible English. And as I'm speaking along with my strange new English voice, I'm also hearing something entirely foreign to the squealing and shouting that constitutes the background noise of Hebrew school. Silence. The children are silent. They're listening to my every word, and they will listen to the story for the next five weeks as well, because Miss S will designate the end of every English period as Gary Novel Time. And the children, they will shout throughout the English period, when will Gary read already? <laughs> <laughs> and I will sit there in my chair, oblivious to all but Miss S's smile, excused from following the discussion of the mouse who learned how to fly, so that I may go over the words I will soon read to my adoring audience. And God bless these kids for giving me a chance. May their God bless them, everyone. because most Soviet immigrants are quite conservative, I've subscribed to another little magazine called The National Review. <laughs> William F. Buckley, Jr., editor. Uh, Margaret Thatcher on the cover, on every cover. <laughs> and then I sent a thick card featuring an American eagle sitting upon two rifles. That's right, Gary Steinbrecht, age 11, is being welcomed into the National Rifle Association. <laughs> Can't start too soon. My republicanism flourished even as I left the provinces of Eastern Queens and ended up at Stuyvesant High School, the holding pen for multinational math and science nerds in the country. And then my political allegiances underwent a change. And this is how it happened. On election day in 1988, I come to the Marriott Marquis Ballroom thinking, this is the day, the day I will finally get laid. <laughs> I have volunteered for George Bush Sr.'s first Earth election presidential campaign against the hapless Michael Dukakis, laughing along with Bush's racist, hysterical Willie Horton commercials and all they imply about the liberal Massachusetts Greek. Compassion, after all, is a virtue only rich Americans can afford. 
tolerance the purview of slick Manhattanites who already have everything that I want. I'm invited to attend what is sure to be a Republican victory party at the Marriott Marquis, the ugly slab of a building near Times Square. The invitation to the party features a scornful cartoon of the big year Dukakis sticking his head out of an M1 Abrams tank, the most unfortunate photo op of the campaign. And I expect an evening of arrogant crowing, of being pressed to the bosom of my fellow conservatives while dancing a Protestant horror over the grave of American liberalism. <laughs> yes, tonight is a special night. It's the night I'm to meet a Republican girl from a clean white home. Her name will be Jane. Jane Carruthers, let's say. <laughs> Hi, Jane Carruthers. I'm Gary Steiger from Lunette Queens. So my family owns a colonial with $200,000. I'm the brains behind a Commodore 64 computer program called the Family Real Estate Transaction Calculator. I go to Stuyvesant High School and my grades aren't so great, but I hope to get into the Honors College at the University of Michigan. I guess tonight is going to be curtains for the governor of Massachusetts. <laughs> I enter the ballroom with dark, gap-toothed immigrants wearing sweat socks and brown penny loafers, and my special and only suit, a highly flammable polyester. <laughs> I navigate the room filled with sparkling anglos clutching single malts without a word said in my direction, without a pair of happy blue eyes reflecting the gray sheen of the crisp nylon tie I picked up for $2 from a Broadway vendor. As George Herbert Walker Bush racks up state after state on the big screens above us. As cheers and laughter circulate around the massively hideous ballroom, I stand alone in a corner, biting down my plastic cup filled with ginger ale and swatting the colorful balloons that seem to have an affinity for my static-inducing color. <laughs> Until a pair of teenage blonde lovelies, the girls I've been waiting for all my life, finally approach with needy smiles on their faces, one of them beckoning for me to come hither with her hand. I'm so excited. I somehow fail to see myself for what I am, a short teenage boy born to a failing country, trapped inside a shiny gunmetal jacket, carrying about a mop of the darkest hair in the room, darker even than Michael Dukakis's Hellenic do. Which one of these girls will be my Jane? Which one will trace the W of my weak chin with her pewter fingers? Which one will take me on her boat and introduce me to the millionaire and his wife? You know something, Daddy? Gary survived communist Russia just so he could join the GOP. <laughs> I think that's very courageous, son. Would you like to throw the old pigskin around with me and Jack Kemp after cocktails? <laughs> just leave your topsiders in the mudroom. <laughs> hey, you, one of the lovely says, me, debonair, unconcerned, me. Yeah, you! I'll have a rum and coke, a splash of ice and a lime. <laughs> Man, you, know, you said no ice, right? She'll have the night coke, lime, no ice. I have been mistaken for the waiter. And the next day, I'm a Democrat. <laughs> section, I thought I'd backtrack to our first days in America. That was a very lovely introduction, and yeah, Hebrew school was tough, but there were a lot of really wonderful things about coming in the, to America in 79. It wasn't just crossing eight time zones, it was being teleported to a different and much better planet. It felt like pure science fiction, an advanced civilization, my first Chevrolet Corvette, and I thought, why is this plane without wings? And there was a lot of pain involved, the pain of losing language and culture and loved ones, and Lenin, of course. But there was something very beautiful about it, too. And here's a little final dispatch from that universe. The first momentous thing that happens to me in Kew Gardens, Queens, is that I fall in love with cereal boxes. We are too poor to afford toys at this point, but we got to eat. Cereal is food. Well, sort of. It tastes grainy, easy, and light, with a hint of false fruitiness. It tastes the way America feels. <laughs> I'm obsessed with the fact that many cereal boxes come with prizes inside, something for nothing. My favorite comes in a box of a cereal called Honeycomb, a box featuring a healthy, freckled white kid. I begin to accept him as an important role model. On a bike, flying through the, flying through the sky. Many years, I learned he's probably popping a weenie, as they say. 
What you get inside each box of honeycomb are small license plates to be tied to the rear of your bicycle. The license plates are smaller than the real thing, but they have a nice metallic heft to them. I keep getting Michigan, a very simple plate, white letters on a black base. I trace the word with my finger. I speak it aloud, getting most of the sounds wrong. Michigan. <laughs> then I have a thick stack of plates. I hold them in my hand and spread them out like playing cards. Each plate is terribly unique. Some states present themselves as America's dairy land. Others wish to live free or die. What I need now in a very serious way is to get an actual bike. In America, the distance between wanting something and having it delivered right to your living room is not terribly great. I want a bike, so some rich American neighbor, and I'll speak of you rich, gives me a bike. A rusted red monstrosity with the spokes coming dangerously in the down. I tie the license plate to the bicycle, and I spend most of my day wondering which plate to use, citrus sunny Florida or snowy Vermont. This is what America is about, choice. I don't have much choice in pals, but there's a one-eyed girl in our building complex who I've sort of befriended. She's tiny and scrappy and poor, just like us. We're suspicious of each other at first, but I'm an immigrant and she has one eye, so we're even. <laughs> the girl rides around on a half-broken bike just like mine, and she keeps falling and scraping herself rumors that's how she lost her eye and bawling whenever her palms get bloody, her blonde hair is up to the sky. One day she sees me riding my banged up bicycle with the honeycomb license plate clanging behind me, and she screams, hey you, it's Michigan, it's Michigan! And I ride ahead smiling and tooting my bike horn so proud of the English letters that are attached somewhere below my ass. It's Michigan, she cries, it's Michigan! Oh, Michigan, this bluish black license plate, the color of my friend's remaining eye. Michigan, she cries, with this delicious American name, Michigan! Michigan, how lucky one must be to live there. Thank you. Hello. Hi, how are you? It's funny meeting you here. <laughs> yeah. Um, that was fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so, you're one of those serious writers, huh? <laughs> Yeah, it's a, you know, I, I always, this is a terrible metaphor, but I think of, of uh, uh, the kind of writing I do is sort of the, the humor is the intercontinental ballistic missile, and the payload is the tragedy. So, it's the way to get it across. Right. Okay. And then, <laughs> <laughs> when did you figure out, or when did you realize that you could, you had that, that weapon of humor to mm -hmm. kind of talk about, whether obviously, yeah, tragic or <laughs> difficult or shaming or complicated experiences like? Well, um, you know, actually, uh, Lenin and his magical goose, I think, was very serious. It's all about Marxist um, dialectics and stuff yeah. like that. So I, I didn't have much of a sense of humor in each five. But in Hebrew school, when I was writing these science fiction books, I also began to write uh, my version of the Torah, which I called the Gonorrah. <laughs> In it, Exodus became Sexodus, <laughs> and, and the uh, progenitor of the Jewish people was not Sarah, but a certain woman named Brooke Shieldowitz, <laughs> who we were all incredibly lovely. So um, I would sneak in the Gedora into, into the bathroom, and, and other kids would bring in uh, foldouts of Brooke Shieldowitz from People magazine. And that was sort of our Sami's dots, our sort of clandestine. <laughs> and that's when I made my first friends, you know, because uh, what happened was that I went from being the, the commie, the red journal, and I began to be seen as just that crazy guy. So when we graduated from Hebrew school, there was a yearbook, and each student was given a song to represent them. And all the other the Russian kids got, you know, back in the USSR or something like that. And I got, they're coming to take me away, ha <laughs> So being called insane is not fun, but it was a huge step up for being Russian. <laughs> and that's what words did. Words helped me transcend that, that, that yeah. definition. Yeah. How did you translate, I mean, so going from being Russian to being an American, you know, and these various efforts you made to sort of fit in either through popular culture, you know, Star Wars, science fiction, politics. Yeah. Dabbling in conservatives. What about Judaism? Like, how did your identity shift from being a Jew in Russia to being a Jew in America? Well, I never felt like a Jew in Russia because you really weren't 
supposed to be a Jew in Russia. Yeah. You know, my father was the one that was very into being Jewish. Uh, my mother is half Jewish. Uh, when I do an interview like with Israeli people, this is when they stop and say, uh, which half? They're <laughs> <laughs> very worried at this point. I say the right half. I say, oh, thank God. You know, can give me this interview. Uh, <laughs> boy. Um, so there was no Jewish identity in Russia. But when we got to America, first of all, yeah, when my father said to me, all right, we got to circumcise you right away. <laughs> I'm talking about an eight-year-old kid here. You know? right, right. Talking about giving at the office, you know. Uh, so that hurt. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a good way to start off with religion, uh, and then and then eight years of Hebrew school, and you know I became very religious. I would I would yell at my parents for Passover if they didn't throw out every last crumb of the, the chumitz and all that stuff. But at the same time, I also felt that you know I began to see the world as a kind of joke in a way. You know, in Russia, I kept worshiping Lenin. Now I was worshiping Reagan. Then we were worshiping you know God. It was just this endless worship of things, uh, and I did it. But somehow, some of it didn't feel... I also thought there was another side of it that wanted to make fun of it. That's why the Gomorrah came about uh, and all of this stuff. And then that's why these four books came about as a way, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm curious, uh, I feel like, you know, coming out here, I, I met you earlier this evening, and we were talking a little bit about our various backgrounds, which are very different. <laughs> but oddly similar. So yeah. You're Russian, you grew up in Russia, I'm Canadian, I grew up in Canada. Basically. <laughs> <laughs> you know that I can wear these tights and a sailor suit, I can wear scratchy little tights and an ill fitting dress. Poor thing. <laughs> you had asthma. Mm -hmm. I had a mysterious illness that prevented me from going out for recess for at least five years straight. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. This is in Quebec or Ontario? Uh, Manitoba, actually. Oh, yeah. okay. very cold. I, I've read about it so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I'm curious because I mean, so I feel this kind of affinity mm -hmm. with you, but you know, recently you were kind of caught up in this uh, altercation again. God. Oh. And I don't want to put you on the spot. No, no, no. no. So you you essentially insulted um, <laughs> all of Canadian literature. <laughs> Therefore, Canada. Oh. <laughs> like Rob Ford, I was stupefyingly drunk. Right. <laughs> uh, it was terrible. I was a little drunk. Uh, they got us drunk and then they right. forced the mic into our faces. Uh, it was amazing, though. The amazing part was the apology tour of Canada uh, that I didn't have to conduct, uh, which was, of course, was one city, Toronto. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I love it. Uh, sales went up like crazy, uh, uh, but I was pretty good. Uh, I apologized. I went up to the Toronto Public Library, uh, the main library, and I got down on my knees in front of the Ontario Arts Council, and I apologized. Right, right, because you had sort of um, said that okay, it was a question about should literature be subsidized, and you basically said, well, it's subsidized in Canada, I'll let what you get. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, these countries. 
these are giant. Uh, but I mean, look at my history, you know, every superpower I live in it starts to collapse. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they won't even let me into China anymore, like <laughs> Yeah, I would be saying, you know, things are bad when I show up at your doorstep. Do you, I mean, in terms of the different identities you have, I mean, is there an audience that, that gets you the most? <laughs> I, mean, I was doing a reading in Ann Arbor uh, last week, and the, uh, the, the librarian, the head of the librarian said, well, you know, the Russians, the Jews, and the town's intellectuals are here, though. those are their three constituencies. <laughs> Not the Star Wars fans. Not the Star Wars fans. Yeah. No. Jews, Russians, and the town's intellectuals. Do you, I mean, do you, do you feel an affinity with a particular audience, or? Hey. Anyone who reads me is a lot of <laughs> I love everyone. Um, no, you know, it's a, uh, look, not a lot of people read in America. I think most of them are here, here tonight. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Philip Roth once said, you know, that there's only 5,000 readers left, and certain readers of serious literature left in America, he said, but if you picture each one of them going through your living room, it'll break your heart. You know? That was in 2000, now there's 4,000 left. But still, it's heartbreaking to think of, of you know, we're, but it's a very tight community. Um, I just feel like we're, we're in it together. It doesn't matter which one of us is, you know, producing the work and consuming the work. We're all, we're all in this together in this little dinghy flying, you know, floating off sort of like the sinking ship. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a more informal writer's subsidy in a way. Yes, so exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would love a grant from the Ontario Arts Council. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought it was Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We're on the Northwestern campus tonight, and I'm curious, yeah, that's right. <laughs> How did Oberlin shape you? I mean, how did yeah. going to... Well, it was tough, you know, because um, I'd grown up uh, a hungry, kielbasa peeled refugee, you know. <laughs> All I wanted was to make money. Uh, I remember watching the movie Wall Street with my parents thinking, so the key is just not to get caught. <laughs> and I bought my fanciest, you know, Ocean Pacific t-shirts to Oberlin and Genera, Union Bay, all those 80s outfits. And the kids were wearing janitor outfits. <laughs> There's this one guy named, you know, he had Bob stenciled on his janitor outfit. And I thought, oh my god, these poor children. <laughs> they have to work as janitors while attending school, you know. I mean, I'm on a scholarship, but I don't have to clean anything, you know. <laughs> and I said, how about that guy, Bob? And my friend said, no, that's John. I said, why does he have Bob? And he's like, oh my god, you're never going to make it here. <laughs> so it took, you know, four years for to get my own ironic, uh, you know, janitor's outfit. <laughs> But it was funny because the year before I actually was cleaning. Uh, I was a janitor at my father's uh, nuclear power plant. We were working at nuclear power plant, which is where this ball was began. <laughs> so I, again, I was doing the actual stuff. Had you known, you would have kept it. I would have kept that thing. It said Gary on it. I was so ashamed of that. You have know, to actually have a janitor's outfit with your name on it. Oh my God. <laughs> Basically, Oberlin made me the jackass I am today. You know, <laughs> no, I love Oberlin. Uh, it, was, it was nice uh, because there were teachers there who said, you know, you shouldn't be a whatever, you should just be a writer. Um, and so Oberlin is a kind, of it's a kind of preparation for the cultural industries in New York or San Francisco or right. Chicago or wherever you end up. Uh, they teach you how to talk the talk and walk the walk. Yeah. I mean, I would love, be very happy to send my child there. Because he already knows what's up, he'll probably go to some Quaker school or whatever. <laughs> he already knows what's up. I was curious about that, because you have a son who's a year old, right? A year old, Just a year old. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. But how has all of this experience that you underwent, which is fairly traumatic, <laughs> how, how are you not passing that on to him? But what, how does that <laughs> you are not. How <laughs> you well, how do you know, right? Like how, how are you kind of trying to be a parent in a way that I don't know, sort of guards against some of that. Well, I waited to, to you know, he was born when I was 41, so I, I waited quite a bit to have a child. Uh, one thing I did, I underwent 15 years of psychoanalysis. Uh, just, you know, not five times a week like those crazy people, just four times. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a 40 hour hour, you know. Um, 
so I felt, you know, that a lot of the stuff had been sort of worked out the way, you know, when you sweat out the toxins. And, and, and this, you know, this memoir is a lot of sweated out toxins. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think it's no coincidence that right when I finished writing this memoir is when we were serious about having a kid. Um, really? So know, it was like... It felt that I had reached an understanding with myself and, and had hopefully created a break in the lineage there a little bit. There were things I really wanted to save from my parents. I mean, their, their incredible senses of humor, mm -hmm. uh, my father's creativity. He was a, I'm mean, talking about satire, when you, you know, we were talking about where my humor comes from. He would, when we moved to Queens, you know, I didn't have any friends. He was my best friend. We would walk around Queens, and he would tell me this soap opera that he created called The Planet of the Yids. <laughs> which was set in outer, outer space, different, different galaxy, but it was a bunch of Jews on a planet being attacked by the space slobs uh, who would launch these large torpedoes uh, at the Jews. And the Jews were protected by Captain Sharansky, so, who built this circumcised space shoe. I've seen something that's been transmitted to you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes. So maybe that was his way of making me feel better about, the, uh, about that. Uh, but it was very funny, it was very satiric, and, and in a sense, when I write you know, some of my books, like Absurdistan, I think were echoes of yeah. my father's sense of humor. So I wanted to say some of that, and I wanted to make sure that, uh, well, I love, you know, he's only here, but I love reading the Russian poetry to him, uh, or just Russian, you know, silly Russian rhymes. It sounds so different, you know, in, in English you read, you know, the, that nice thing about uh, the kittens and mittens, good night, good night, everyone. See you later. <laughs> Good night, mortgage. Good night. <laughs> but in Russian, you know, you read to me, you, you teach the alphabet, so each each one each letter has its own sound. So there's a I'll do that, which is a great trick. Рис рычит на берегу, поймать рыбку не могу, хоть она недалеке не достать ее в реке. And my kid's eyes open up. He's like, holy crap! I can't. <laughs> Sounds like this exists, you know. So that makes me feel like there is some kind of connection, even if he doesn't learn uh, uh, Russian. He'll learn Mandarin like all the other kids in the world. <laughs> yes, he is eternal. Let's take some questions. So, you're this um, novel when you wrote, five years old, about Lenin taking goose. Is it prophetic because Putin takes some goods, Strelkov, whatever, and then way to train? Yes. Do you feel prophetic? And in this case, what you, what you predict is now? Yes. <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, yes. Uh, the fact checker and me will correct it. It wasn't a goose, it was a crane. But, but close enough, very close enough. Yes, I am working right now on a young adult novel called Putin and His Magical Goose. <laughs> And if Putin finds out that the goose is gay, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so watch out for Putin and his gay goose coming to it. It'll sell a lot better than this, I assure you. Thank you. Got one back there. Okay. Gary, last year you were. The subject of a great article in the New Yorker as a beta tester for a Google Glasses. You don't seem to be wearing those this evening. You still, you still use the Google Glasses. Uh, yes, the question is, do I use the Google Glasses? The answer is no. <laughs> uh, the Google Glass was sort of a, what person called it, a segue for your face. <laughs> Uh, it was an interesting experience, uh, being what they call glass holes. Uh, <laughs> it was fascinating. So, uh, yeah, so in San Francisco, there's a huge uh, backlash. Uh, that's where the term glass holes originated. Uh, but I wore it to New York to the trendiest Williamsburg bars, usually where I wouldn't even be looked at. Uh, and I'd walk in the velvet rope and part, and everyone was like, oh my god. And I'd walk up to, to you know, young people in their just out of college or in college, and I'd say, uh, I'd be wearing my glasses, and I'd say, hi, I'm from the NSA. Uh, and I'm looking, at, I'm looking at your emails right now. And they'd say, well, thank you. Nobody ever reads my emails. So it's going to be 
a great century. <laughs> Um, first, I want to say that Little Failures was an, uh, an amazing book. It was, uh, to reveal your soul as you did was uh, inspiring to me as a, as a writer. The I'll blurb you. You want to blurb? <laughs> you know, okay. I want advice. Oh, advice, yeah, yeah. Because I see the world, I see the world changing, the, very, uh, the climate changing, and I feel like we're, we're about to go through some very tough times. And uh, the Jewish writer, I think, is uh, someone that needs to be one one of the main people leading the way. And I'm wondering, and I think you're one of the greatest Jewish writers oh, right now. So I, I'd like to hear your opinion on, I guess, our future and how you see the role of the Jewish writer. Well, it's going to be a tough future, um, I think. If you bring up global warming, and every, you know, nothing's really that great. But then again, I'm what you call a sap, uh, a Soviet Ashkenazi pessimist. So. <laughs> Take everything I say with a huge brain of everything. Uh, no, it's tough. You know, I, I look at my kids and I think, um, God, I'm not going to be the pushy immigrant father or, you know, not the tiger dad, or the, the bear dad, I guess I would be doing. Uh, I'm not going to be like that. But at the same time, the, the world he's going to grow up in is going to be very different from the world that, uh, that I grew up in, because I grew up in the 80s and he's grown up in a different time. So it's, it's tough. I mean, you know, the, the term rule of failure came about when my mother uh, and it, she took the English word failure and connoted an yeah. immunity of failure in Chicago. So it's part English, part Russian. Um, it happened when I graduated from Oberlin. And, uh, you know, they spent a hundred grand on that school. And I was living, so they said, at least go to law school. You're too dumb for med school, go to law school. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm living in this apartment um, in the Lower East Side. This is before we gentrified it, when it had an actual, you know, people were living there. And I was living in a five-floor walk-up and completely sloping floor. So you, you go to bed here and you wake up here. <laughs> and my roommate was this like three foot long cockroach. Uh, <laughs> he spoke English and Russian. He was, he was, he was Gregor. He was so good. <laughs> so my mother walks in and says hi to the roach and says, you know, looks around and says, you, my friend, are a failure, a little failure. Uh, and that was her way of encouraging me to go to law school. That was not great. <laughs> but these days, I wonder what I would say to my kid when he's that age. You know, of course, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't call him a little failure or anything like that because, you know, the analysis. But, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm going to give her a... There's a cute name of him in America named Johnny. Uh, like he's Johnny Steinberg. <laughs> um, but, yeah, uh, you know, it's, um, it's tough because I wish he'd grown up 20 years ago. Then I'd say, just go to forestry school or whatever your heart desires. Uh, this was a land of almost unlimited possibilities a while ago. And now, of course, it's not. But no one's to blame. These things happen. Everything goes up. Then things go down. And the same thing with reading. You know, I think nobody reads now. But I think 300 years from now, <laughs> look at the collapse of the Roman Empire. The reading completely went out of style and was replaced mostly by the visual arts. And then many centuries later, Dante, you know. <laughs> I know that my great 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 grandchildren will love books. <laughs> so let's try and get one more question in. Just keep it real tight, if you know. Hi, I'm, I'm just curious who your um, favorite comedians are. <laughs> this is funny, yeah, funny you ask because uh, uh, I was just asked to do uh, uh, an article on uh, comedy in China. So. <laughs> I'm fairly sure about it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It'll be very long. There's, there's so many funny comedians out there in China. Um, this guy named Storm, I love them. Storm Chain. Um, yeah, look him up, he's good. Um, you know, I haven't, it's, it's really interesting. I've, I've always been scared of comedy, stand up comedy. Um, People, you know, you walk down the streets of New York and there's always some guy in the giant sandwich board saying, hey, hey, you, you missed him. You like to laugh? Uh, here's tickets to a comedy club. And I'm always so scared of those people, even. Uh, but to me, the idea of standing up, look, I'm sitting down all the time, standing up and pacing around and going like this all the time. <laughs> you know. It's scary. I, I feel like, I take a little bit of out of it, but this would require a whole lot of <laughs> But as every other you know person in America, I think Louis C.K. is the one I enjoy right now because he's you know he can he can t tell a, 
a masturbation joke for like 40 minutes. <laughs> In China, you'd never hear that. People are busy actually working. You know? It's also like you using humor to talk about really serious issues. Yeah, yeah he's, he's got a lot of problems too. <laughs> so I think, I think, uh, I think stand-up comedy has become a real art form only really very recently. Uh, and I wish I had the courage to do stand-up. Uh, I don't. Literature is sort of now a minor art, field, art form compared to to television and stand-up, but uh, like I said, a couple centuries. <laughs>